thank you, Dr. Goyal. In fact, it's an honor to uh, to have uh, Professor Vaidya amongst us and who is going to deliberate uh, on his recent publication. Professor Vaidya is the Professor of Surgery and Oncology and uh, Scientific Director uh, Surgical Intervention Trial Units uh, in the University College of London. And uh, he has been the, uh, he's the principal investigator of the Target A trial. And uh, I'm very eager to listen to you, uh, Professor Vaidya, kindly, kindly start. Thank you and very thanks much. For, Thank you. Thanks for accepting our invitation to, to be the guest uh, today. Thank you very much. And it is a real pleasure to uh, give this talk uh, to everybody here uh, with such eminent members. And um, <clears throat> let me start then. So this is the writing committee, Professor Tobias, uh, Professor Balsara, and Professor Baum. Uh, and those are the authors. There are 39 authors in this paper. And it was published in the British Medical Journal uh, just in, month of August, in the month of August. And it did receive a lot of uh, media attention. <clears throat> this is the <clears throat> top is the International Steering Committee. And the bottom half shows this trial steering committee, independent steering committee appointed by the National Institute of Health Research, which governed the trial from the time of the last publication. I must not forget to thank uh, and acknowledge every one of the investigator teams in these uh, centers around the world and all the patients who participated in the trial. Without them, this trial couldn't have happened. And these are the photographs of all the authors uh, as you can see, they come from all over the world, um, and uh, each of them has done a lot of work to make sure that we have this complete follow-up of, of this uh, in this trial after such a long time. So the Target A trial asked a straightforward question. Can risk-adapted single dose target IORT given during lumpectomy for breast cancer effectively replace the usual post-operative course of daily radiotherapy, which normally goes on from three to six weeks. The recruitment of the trial started from March 2000 and ended in July 2012, over 12 years. A lot of the detail of the target trial and the details about literature, in fact, all of the literature is available on the website called target.org.uk. This is the next slide is my uh, conflict of interest is grant funding from NIHRHTA and I do receive some honoraria and travel reimbursement from Carl Zeiss. So you, you all will know how we have moved from radical surgery in which people did and some of us have done this uh, radical mastectomy to more targeted surgery and that has taken nearly 100 years for it to become standard of care between 1894 when William Halstead did the first uh, sure, demonstrated the safety of uh, radical, radi radical mastectomy. And over the last 25 years, we have moved from radical radiotherapy to more targeted radiotherapy. And that is a story I hope to tell you in this, uh, in this talk. And I go back to history to Tata Memorial Hospital. And you can see here back in 1992, when I was a chief resident in Tata Hospital, I had to tell patients that you have breast cancer. And the next question I had to ask them was, can you stay in Bombay for six weeks of radiotherapy after the operation? And these were, these were patients whose breasts could be preserved, but only if they said yes. If they said they cannot actually stay in Bombay, they have to go back to um, their um, home in North India or elsewhere, they had to have a mastectomy because the package was lumpectomy plus whole breast radiotherapy. And this was a big concern. It was not a very nice thing to say to patients. But I thought this was only limited to India. It is not. When I started talking to people around the world, it, is, it happens in, you know, in California, three miles from UCSF. My colleague, Dr. Michael Alvaro, tells me people don't want to cross the Bay Bridge uh, when he sees them in the county hospital. This happens in Europe, in Australia, in Denmark. So people really don't like this traveling every day and repeated visits to the hospital. And this is even more important in the days of COVID. So this concern about breast cancer patients and the curiosity about breast cancer led me to do this whole organ analysis of mastectomy specimens. And that time, uh, my mentor was Professor uh, Dr. Uh, Neil Mitra. And what we found was quite unusual. We found that cancers were widespread all along the breast, all over the breast. And this was the first time we had done a three-dimensional analysis. But this was at odds with where the local recurrence occurs. Now, local recurrence occurs mainly around the index quadrant. As you can see here, the red dots show the local recurrence events. 
If they occur in other parts of the breast, it also occurs at similar frequency in the other breast. So if you're not treating the other breast, why treat the whole breast? That was the question I asked when I presented this for the first time when I went abroad in Hong Kong in 1995. And the paper was published in 1996 in British Journal of Cancer. And then that's when I met Professor Michael Baum. And uh, this is a letter we wrote together with Michael Baum and uh, Dr. Neil Mitra uh, to say that logical sequence of this study is we should do a clinical trial to test whether radiotherapy to the index quadrant alone can achieve good local control. Now, when I say we began pilot studies, that was because there was fortuitous uh, meeting with the industry who were looking, uh, who, had, who had this device, which had not yet been used in, you know, for breast cancer or cancer, and they needed it to be modified. So that is what happened between 1996, 1998 to 2000. We made a device in collaboration industry to test this idea. So it was an idea, academic insight that led to the collaboration in industry to do a new treatment, new technique in order to test the approach, which was based on precision and immediacy of radiotherapy. So this is a photograph of a multidisciplinary team in 20 years ago, University College London, that is Professor Baum, that is Professor Tobias. You can see Dr. Neil Mitra here, and uh, that is Professor Irvin Taylor, you may have uh, known. So the surgical technique, we described this in 2002 in European Journal of Surgical Oncology. It's a straightforward technique. Uh, this is a photograph taken on the first day we did this operation. This is the tumor bed, and that's a spherical applicator that goes inside the uh, tumor bed. It is kept in place very securely and uh, very accurately with the purse string. And that's Professor Baum and Professor Tobias, you can see in the photographs. So you can see the applicator going into the tumor bed and uh, 50 kV radiation is emitted from the tip of this um, tip of this tube, and a uniform dose of radiation is given around the spherical applicator. We can choose different sizes of applicators from 1.5 to 5 centimeters, depending on the tumor bed. So you can individualize the correct treatment on this. The radiotherapy is delivered immediately after lumpectomy under the same anesthetic. It is focused to the radiation. Uh, around the tumor bed. And these are the tissues at highest risk of relapse. It therefore avoids normal structures from being irradiated, heart and the lungs. Again, the principle of precision and immediacy. The first 25 patients we did were using this as a boost because we wanted to be sure that it can be done. And we found it was safe to do it. It was possible to do it in a normal operation theater. It's important to remember that this does not require a separate special operation theater. You don't need to have lead lining of any operation theater. The usual cement walls of an operation theater are enough. And radiation protection officers can check this for you in your operation theater. So it is something that is quite easy to adopt. Now, the most important question was, how does this compare with whole breast radiotherapy in terms of its efficacy and safety? And this was in the target A trial. We gave it, gave the name of the procedure a name called target, targeted intraoperative radiotherapy. The trial started in March, 2000. So this is important to recognize that this trial was testing an approach, an approach of risk adapted radiotherapy compared with standard radiotherapy that is same radiotherapy for everybody. So it is not testing IORT versus EBRT. It's testing IORT for everybody with additional EBRT in some patients, about 20%. That is the whole approach that is being tested in the randomized trial. So if additional EBRT is added, it is not a trial violation. It is part of the protocol. And we expect that that to be the case so that eight out of 10 women will get away without needing any further radiotherapy. That was the ultimate aim. The second important point is that the age and the type of cancers were very broad. You have to be only more than or equal to 45 years of age with a single focus on clinical examination and routine imaging. MRI was not required. The tumor size was preferably less than three and a half centimeters. And this was because the applicator size was five centimeters. So it is small, uh, relatively small T2 tumors were completely acceptable. And what I understand is in India, the median tumor size is three and a half centimeters. If that is the case, half the patients in India would be eligible for this uh, treatment. So the first publication happened in July, 2010. And the Lancet, when they published this in, the, in, the main, uh, in their paper, 
we were very surprised that they put our conclusion on the front page of the Lancet, saying that for selected patients, target IORT should be considered an alternative to whole breast radiotherapy. And that was now 10 years ago. In addition to this front page, they also had a comment by an independent person, uh, Dr. David uh, um, Azria. And what he said was this, that it is one method which is, he really quite praised it. And he said, this now can be the new standard of care for selected patients. There are many obvious benefits of target IORT for breast cancer. Now they look obvious, but this is what we have found in proper studies. Cosmetic outcome is superior. This was found earlier in 2003. And then with objective assessment with Professor um, Mokeshkar, again, it was found to have superior cosmetic outcome. What happens is with target IORT, the cosmetic outcome remains constant all throughout. The DBRT, it goes down a bit. So statistically, it is stable in target IORT compared with DBRT. Quality of life is superior with target IORT, and this is found independently by two groups. One was in Australia and one was in Germany. So radiation-related quality of life was found to be superior. Cosmetic outcome, again, was found to be superior with target IORT. Another symptom which patients can have is pain. And in fact, the pain is not uncommon at all after normal surgery and radiotherapy. And we found that with IORT, the pain related to surgery, this is a study from Copenhagen with uh, uh, Dr. Henrik Pleiger. And this is again from Elena Spurk and Professor Wenz from Germany, showing that pain, breast symptoms and arm symptoms are significantly reduced with target IORT. Now, this was a question about preference. And here we said, we assume that there is a 10% recurrence risk with target. Will you still prefer it? And this, these were studies in US and in America. And everywhere they found that the patients would prefer to have target IORT. And even doctors as patients, and that is the question asked by Tammy Korika in this paper, and doctors would still prefer to have target IORT. Whether it is cost saving or not, and this is really an important point. And, um, this was a study in US and in US radiation therapy is extremely expensive. So this was a study by Michael Alvarado who found that over five years, US would save $1.4 billion in the US if all suitable patients got IORT, target IORT. I say target IORT because it should be differentiated from other types of IORT. This was a study from UK where about 9 million pounds would be saved per year and this does not include the environmental and patient or societal costs. And I'll come to that in a second. And this is the environmental cost. You can see this study was done in the UK and in two centers in which we tried to map how much time the patient takes and how much travel the patient saves by taking target IORT. And it is not a simple journey. I mean, patients have to travel sometimes an hour, two hours. And this video is taken to go from a patient's own town to Oxford for taking their radiotherapy. And although it's safe, it is a, it, it, it's, it does, it's not a nice journey for patients to have. And you can see this map, even in the UK, each of these dots represents a circle of 13 miles. So everybody in the green area has to travel more than 13 miles every day for taking their radiotherapy for many days. So we say, maybe jokingly, but in real terms, it does reduce uh, carbon dioxide and it could reduce global warming. Another important point about target is that it improves tumor microenvironment. And this was a very surprising finding and done with a group in Italy where, and it is very scary for all of us surgeons, when we do an operation, the fluid that collects in the wound after the operation, if you take that and put it on breast cancer cell lines, this surgical fluid stimulates cancer cell proliferation, motility and invasiveness. That's a scary thought, but the good news was that if you give on target IORT, this stimulatory effect of surgical wounding, which is probably very good for wound healing and has evolutionarily been uh, sustained all this time, would be inhibited by getting target IORT. But it does not inhibit wound healing in terms of the skin. This is in the depth. Your skin doesn't get the radiation, so it heals well. In the depth of the wound where the fluid is, you find that the invasiveness is reduced, as you can see the central bar compared to the out lateral bar and the fluid cells moving are so much more in the top of this diagram compared to the lower half, which has received target IORT. So this is biologically suggests that target improves tumor microenvironment 
for the benefit of the patient. So we published the new the first five year results of local control and overall survival in 2013, November. And that is when a lot of centers around the world started using this um, technique. And now there are 260 centers around the world and about 45,000 patients have been treated. But breast cancer has a long natural history and long-term outcomes are therefore important. So we have been pursuing to get long-term data for this trial for the last three or four years. I mean, it has been going on for all these years, but it accelerated in the last two, three years. So the first patient was randomized in March, 2000, and the long-term outcome data log was on 3rd of July, 2019. For this, we kept the completeness of follow-up. We set the bar really high. What we said is that follow-up is to be considered complete only if 95% patients had at least five-year complete follow-up. And at least 90% patients had either a 10-year follow-up or were seen within the previous year. So this was a very high bar and we achieved this bar. And to test that, regularly blinded data set was sent to the statistician to see if follow-up was complete or not. And only when the follow-up was complete, then was the time when uh, the, the data was uh, unblinded. And you can see one example. I said, of I said, we have lost two patients. I'm so sorry about that. One has immigrated to Finland and one have immigrated to Bulgaria. And this is out of how many patients? As out of uh, 534 patients, <laughs> we have lost two. And I'm so sorry for that. I'm trying to get data on the lady who uh, immigrated to Finland. I got a phone number, but she don't pick up the phone. But the one who immigrated to Bulgaria, I'm sorry to say, I think I lost her. Oh. <laughs> this was, we have so this lost. was, so this is uh, Dr. Henrik Pleider from Copenhagen. Uh, and this is the way we have tried to get the quest for complete follow-up. Teams all over the world helped to get this completeness to 95%. And the C2 team in UCL was really instrumental in making sure all this is uh, properly entered, kept blinded, and then sent to the statistician only after the uh, SAP, the statistical analysis plan was signed off by the independent chair and another senior independent statistician, right? So the follow-up is now complete. So we can see here, the graph shows the actual and expected follow-up of patients in both arms of the trial they're close to each other. So this is a extremely robust data set now. And comparing the amount of follow-up in all the other partial breast radiation trials for invasive breast cancer, you can see these skyscraper graph in which the left hand most is target A. And each of these bars tells you the number of patients who have that many follow-ups. So red bar tells you that there are more than 2000 patients with five year follow-up. And you can see here thousand patients have nine year follow-up. And comparing that with other trials, this is the graph which is published <clears throat> in the British Medical Journal. So as I said, the unblinded data set was sent to the trial statistician in July 2019 after the SAP was signed by the chair of the independent TSC and the senior statistician. And Professor Balsara was the chief statistician of the trial. I want to remind you of the randomization. It is risk-adapted radiotherapy versus whole breast radiotherapy. First thing to check is whether randomization worked and there was no difference in any of the patient and tumor characteristics in the uh, two arms of the trial. And what is important here to recognize is that age and BMI, who are the very strong um, risk factors for uh, causes from other deaths, other causes were very similar in the two arms of the trial. So what are the advantages to the patient? Surgery and radiotherapy is completed at the same time. It is good cosmetic outcome. There is less pain, there are fewer complications. So all very good. But the patient is thinking this, what is my chance? I've had this, all these benefits. What is my chance of living without the cancer coming back? Is that as good? And this is the important point. These are the long-term outcomes now. Here we can see that local recurrence-free survival, the chance of a woman living without the cancer coming back in the breast, invasive cancer coming back in the breast was no different between the two arms of the trial. At five years, it was 94.2% versus 94.2%. So no difference at all. Chance of living without having a mastectomy was exactly the same 
And you can see that uh, many times the curves of the target go slightly above, but there's no difference. Chance of a distant disease coming back and living without distant disease was exactly the same. Breast cancer specific survival was the same. And you can see this graph in a you know, magnified view as published in the journal in this graph in which you can see the two lines for breast cancer mortality are on top of each other. And now comes the interesting point in this trial is that the non-breast cancer mortality continued to separate from the time we saw it last time. And the line for target for overall survival always remained above that for EBRT. And these are the magnified graphs. You can see here that non-breast cancer mortality was significantly lower with target IORT with a difference nearly halving from 9.85 to 5.41. And overall survival, again, there are separated lines, but because of the dilution with the breast cancer mortality, it is not statistically significant. So in 2000, and, uh, 2000, the trial started. In 2010, we published the first results. And now we have published the long-term results, which show that breast cancer control is comparable to EBRT, and there is reduced non-breast cancer mortality with target IORT compared with EBRT. So these are the results in one slide, which show that similar local frequency survival, the primary outcome, and non-breast cancer mortality, the target is better. And if you can see this, in absolute terms, you can see that this is 9.85% versus 5.41, a difference of 4.4% at 12 years. Now, some facts here to set, some, set the record straight. And these are things that if you already read about this trial, I want to set these facts right. This is already there in the paper. Target A has the largest amount of follow-up data amongst PBI trials of invasive breast cancer. Fact number two, it was not a low risk population. There seems to be some concept that it is a low risk population. It is not. There were nearly 2000 patients who were all younger than 70 years. There were more than 400 patients in each of the high risk groups of grade three cancers, positive nodes and ERPR nodes. So see that the node positivity rate is 22%. So that is not dissimilar from the 26% node positivity in most of the sentinel node biopsy projects. So really, these are not really low risk patients. Sorry. This is the other, other fact for target IORT is better than no radiotherapy. Now there are randomized trials of no radiotherapy. They were all smaller than target A trial. The CLGB, BASO2 and PRIME2 trials had very restrictive inclusion criteria. They had to be older patients. The tumor size had to be much smaller the grade either had to be grade one or grade one or two with, with no LVI if they're grade three, they all had to be node negative. Imagine that with a 22% node positivity in target A trial. They had to have no lymphovascular invasion and they had to be ER positive. And there were no such restrictions in target A trial. And despite that, in the experimental arm in the target A trial, the recurrence rate was two to three times lower than no radiotherapy. And this is important, although you can't compare trials with trials, this is important to recognize that with target IORT, there is local control. And this is at five years of absolute local control in terms of local recurrence-free survival, it is no different. And in long-term, no difference in local recurrence-free survival and fewer deaths from other causes. So in many ways, by getting target, patients finishes the radiotherapy during the operation, it's like having nothing done and four out of five times, they don't have to have any more radiotherapy. So it is as if they can have the cake and eat it too. Now, uh, the next fact is that the reduced mortality in target trial is actually consistent with other PBI trials. So we did this meta-analysis in 2016, published in the Red Journal, and then we published an update in the Lancet in two years ago, including the import low trial, where we, it was very clear that with PBI versus WBI, the diamond for the difference was zero for breast cancer deaths. There was a significant reduction in non-breast cancer deaths and a significant reduction in total deaths as well. So giving partial breast radiation seems to reduce overall mortality. And this is not completely uh, implausible. EBRT is known to cause cardiac perfusion defects within six months. And this has been demonstrated long ago. And this is the reason why people are trying to reduce the dose by giving various breath holding techniques but none of the breath holding techniques have actually been tested in randomized trials to be really effective or not. 
in smokers radiotherapy causes a lot of um, side effects and caroline taylor has shown how over the course of 30 years there is a 6% increase in over mortality from lung cancer and heart attacks among smokers now giving external beam radiotherapy does not reduce mortality by 6% so smokers should really not be given external beam radiotherapy when they have early breast cancer the next fact is about other trials of nsabp and I would like to propose that target IORT is probably better than other methods of partial breast radiation. I'm going to try and compare them with others. And the overall, overall outcome that I would like to say is clearly for early breast cancer, partial breast radiation seems to be a better option than giving radiation to the whole breast. And we should remember that the recently pushed past fast forward is actually whole breast radiotherapy. And it does have quite severe side effects. So we shouldn't uh, substitute any other methods of partial breast radiation with five days of uh, fast forward study. Now, looking at the NSABP trial, NSABP protocol requires 10 fractions given over eight days. And every day you have to have two fractions for the patient, the whole day is gone. And that's for 10 days, for eight days at least. There's an additional procedure that's required for the balloon. There is always an inherent delay in starting radiotherapy. We don't have data for the balloon uh, patients separately. And importantly, there is higher grade two and grade three toxicity. And if that is not an important, uh, that's not an unimportant uh, amount. Secondly, 3D CRT and IMRT still leads to scatter radiation. And there is no reduction found in the trial in overall mortality. Rapid trial still requires 10 fractions over five to eight days. Again, the whole day is gone for every one of these days. There is delay. There is increased grade two and grade three toxicity. Again, scatter radiation is still there with rapid trial. So both these seem to have a much higher grade two and grade three toxicity in the PBI arm compared to the WBI arm. And that is not something that is trivial. We published our data about delayed second procedure target IORT as well. Of course, it needs second procedure. Overall, it is not non-inferior, but if you restrict it to ERPR positive and HER2 negative patients given endocrine therapy, it is indeed non-inferior. And this has been published in JAMA Oncology in the month of August. The local recurrence-free survival is not different from EBRT and mastectomy-free survival is not different from EBRT. However, this is not our preferred method of giving target IORT at all. It, we believe it should be given during the lumpectomy procedure. Then comes the Elliott study. Elliott is the only other RCT of intraoperative radiotherapy their local recurrence rate at five years was 4.4 versus 0.4%, and we don't have long-term outcomes. We wonder whether the excessive tissue dissection that occurs and the tissue ischemia could be possibly the reason why they had their radiotherapy was not as effective. And there is much more shielding required in the operation theater because it's high energy. You can see what I mean by that. When target, that's the cavity, you put this applicator from within the breast and give the radiotherapy. Whereas with Elliot, you have to do a massive tissue dissection, bring the tissues uh, central part of the breast together and then give the radiotherapy by inserting uh, um, a big uh, shield behind the breast. So there may be deoxygenation of tissues being irradiated compared to the fresh intact tumor bed with target IORT. But this is of course only a hypothesis. Next comes the Florence trial. It's really a quite a small trial of 260 patients in each arm. There was better cosmetic and toxicity profile, but still it is two weeks of treatment, five non-consecutive days. And there are quite severe dose constraints from what I can see. You need to have one centimeter radius of the dose around the clips, and it should not be within three millimeters of the skin and not more than four millimeters from the lung. Imagine many patients with uh, breast cancer with their breasts lying that way. You, you, if your tumor is close to skin, you can't use this treatment at all. And it is EBRT, it still gives rise to scatter radiation. The Jack Estro trial has had excellent efficacy results. It has better toxicity profile, but it's still eight fractions over the course of four days. And when we give patients a choice, we should show them photographs of what happens. And this is what happens when partial breast radiation is given using uh, wires. Um, many of us feel this is not a particularly nice site to show patients but that doesn't mean they should not know how it happens. It also requires additional procedure. Import low trial, we don't have long-term data. 
And most importantly, it requires three weeks of daily radiotherapy plus the visits for planning. And in terms of all, after all that reduction in dose, there should have been some improvement in toxicity profiles. It wasn't the case really. Um, in terms of PROMs, there were two PROMs in which there was improvement. And that was out of 72 different PROMs being recorded. In terms of the Budapest trial, again, uses wires. It is twice a day for seven days. And there are again, dose constraints. And it is a small trial of 130 versus 128 patients. So in conclusion, what I would like to say is risk adapted target IoT given during lumpectomy um, achieved comparable long-term cancer control to EBRT. It reduced non-breast cancer mortality compared with EBRT. It has substantial advantages with better quality of life, cosmetically superior outcomes, less pain. Of course, it is much more convenient for the patient. And in four out of the five times, they don't have to have any more radiotherapy. It's all completed during the operation. There is less travel time. And importantly, there is lower cost to the patient and healthcare system. So we now with these results feel quite strongly that eligible patients should be offered target IORT as a one-stop treatment option during their lumpectomy for breast cancer. In the UK, the Montgomery ruling has said that if patients are not given all the reasonable alternatives, they should all be given reasonable alternatives. And that is the GMC guidance as well. And it is now the law that all patients should be given these alternatives, not just because of the preference of the treating team, but whatever the patient might want to know. So if you don't do this, they could be breaking the law. So now NICE, gave approval recommendation for this to be used in centers that have the equi equipment in 2018, 17. It has been adopted all around the world. So these are all international meetings. This is in 2016 user meeting. This has been going on for many years, but these are the recent photographs of 2016 Mannheim meeting in Germany. That is in Bangkok in 2016. And this was a meeting in, again, in US, Mannheim, so overall, this is a center, this is a study uh, in which, which is uh, being uh, submitted for publication. There are uh, 260 centers around the world in 38 countries who have offered target IORT to their patients. Uh, in India, it has been used in Hyderabad and uh, by Dr. Wamsi and his team and in, uh, uh, in Bombay by Dr. Sanjay Sharma. And all of those patients have been now counted and each center has told me how many patients they have treated. And the total number is 44,500 plus, I have, I have to add another 250 to that. So it becomes nearly 45,000 have been treated with target IRT around the world. I believe it should be available to every suitable patient and the technology is in fact less expensive than normal radiotherapy. So I hope this new publication makes it more easily available to people around the world. Thank you very much for your listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vaidya, for such a wonderful, wonderful talk.